Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 199 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers. (laughs) Save that. Save that. All right. (laughs) I am here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. That's exciting. It is very exciting. 200 feels big. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more next week, but it just coincidentally happens that the day our 200th episode drops is also the four year anniversary of the show, which that's That's just amazing. It's just that it lined up that way. It is because yeah, in the early, in the early years, we would take a couple weeks vacation. So we did maybe 48 or 50 episodes per year. And then we ramped up and we did more. So like, there's no reason that the, that the four year anniversary and the 200th episode mathematically would line up out perfectly. It does. It's like, yeah, when I I was so happy when I discovered that. Amazing. So, but we're not there yet. It's 199. And we are taking your listener questions today. We took a few last week um, and we like to do these in pairs. So we have four more really good listener questions today. So thank you guys for sending those in and we can't wait to get to them. But first up, we're going to talk about our first sponsor. Yeah, I am excited to talk about Prep Dish today. Um, So I love how we always talk about meal planning as a goal at the beginning of the year. And then like, as though we just do it then, and then that's it. Right. (laughs) And then two months later, I feel like it's still all I can think about. Like either I get into a rut or I feel like it's kind of getting stale. It just shows you that meal planning is something you really do have to think about year round. And sometimes that means changing what you're doing to accommodate like a new diet changes to your schedule or honestly, just the boredom that can yeah. happen when you've been doing the same thing for a while. So if you're with me there, check out Prep Dish. It's a great way to re-energize a lackluster meal plan with healthy whole foods recipes, as well as help you create more time on weekday evenings. So when you sign up for Prep Dish, you receive an email every week with a grocery list and instructions for prepping your meals ahead of time. Then you just shop once, prep once, and have meals ready for the week, and they come together really easily on the nights you choose to serve them. It's a great way to eat healthy meals that are real foods only. They have uh, gluten-free, dairy-free, and paleo options. And this year, they've actually added keto meal plans, which I think it's a great way to try out keto without having to, like, fall down a scary internet rabbit hole. Because I've been on some of those Facebook groups for keto, and it's scary, you guys. Yeah, no Uh, kidding. So so what have you been been eating lately, Sarah? Yeah, well, we actually did prep dish this week, and my favorite recipe was a frittata with arugula, tomato, and mushrooms and dilled cucumbers on the side. Let me tell you, I have enjoyed frittatas before. I would never have thought we could do all of the work on a frittata, have it chilled in the fridge, and heat it up for dinner like three days later, and it was so delicious. So Allison just blows my mind with the things that she is able to turn into prep ahead meals. I love it. Well, Allison is offering listeners a free two week trial to try out prep dish. So if you've been meaning to try keto or want some new gluten free or paleo recipes to try, or if you just want to get on top of your meal plans for, for once and for all, you can't beat this deal. Go to prepdish.com slash the mom hour to try it again. That's prepdish.com slash the mom hour. And you're going to get your first two weeks for free. Awesome. Well, we are also excited to welcome a new sponsor today, and that is Swap.com. So I don't know if you know this about me, Megan, but I love thrift and consignment shopping. I always have. There's something about getting like a gently used item that's name brand for like $4. That's just so satisfying for $4 me. $4 is pretty satisfying Four dollars, well. right? Yeah. So when my kids were little, I always browsed our local kids consignment store. But now where we live, there isn't one that's convenient to me. And I've actually been really missing it until I got on swap.com recently. So it's an online consignment marketplace where you can save up to 90% off retail prices on your favorite brands like Lululemon, Carter's, Nike, J. Crew, Gap. They have women's, men's, juniors, kids, baby and maternity. They even have a few toys like Thai Beanie Boos, which are a huge hit in my house. And I just picked up a few for Violet's Easter basket. Also, if something doesn't fit, they have hassle-free returns within 30 days. And that's unusual. Not all consignment stores do that. Right. That's really nice. Yeah. So I don't have to tell you guys the crazy prices these days on new clothes and shoes for kids. It's crazy, especially when we know they're going to outgrow them in what feels like a hot second. So what's cool is the filters and search functionality on swap.com made it super easy for me to find exactly what I was looking for. I got some like new Javiana flip flops for Reed and a size 14 gray hoodie for Allegra. I narrowed it right down so I could find exactly what I was looking for. And it's all on its way right to my door. So we have a special offer for you guys. 
guys, go to swap.com slash mom hour. Once you're there, you can sign up and you'll get free shipping on your first purchase. It's kind of a low risk way to give this online thrifting a try. I think you're going to like it. Again, it's swap.com slash mom hour. Sign up there and you will get free shipping on your first purchase. So check it out. Yeah, do it. Okie dokie. So here we go into our first question. We're going to play it and it comes from Brady. Hey, Megan and Sarah, this is Brady from Franklin, Tennessee. And I was just wondering if you had any tips and strategies to help little kids cope with a big move. We recently moved a couple months ago from Texas and we moved away from all of our family, um, parents, grandparents, cousins, Um, And my five-year-old in particular is having a little bit of a hard time, specifically when anybody comes to visit us or when we travel back to Texas for a visit. Um, The few days after each visit, he's teary and says that he misses our old house and he misses his grandparents. And I understand that I'm sure all of this is normal for his age because his whole world was completely turned upside down and he has a really close relationship with his grandparents and his cousins and he misses them. And of course we, you know, we call and we FaceTime, but sometimes that makes him even more sad after we hang up. So I'm just wondering if you have any specific tips for helping him cope with this big change and just helping him accept that this is our life now and help him be excited about our new life. Um, you know, our new situation instead of just being sad about what he left behind. Um, thanks guys. I love listening to y'all and I feel like I know you and I so appreciate all of your helpful encouragement and advice. Oh, this was like a little bit heartbreaking I know. for me because first of all, I relate. My oldest was four and a half when we moved out of state and five is such a, a rough age because they really do um, remember their friends and their home. It's not like a two-year-old who literally will forget last week that they lived in right. another state. Um, but five-year-olds are also not quite mature enough to kind of have weathered this kind of transition or heartbreak before. They haven't changed schools a lot. They haven't right. had a lot of practice you know, just going through life's transition. So this is really, it, it, it is really hard. So I'm just acknowledging um, that it is hard. I think I thought about this and I think I would take kind of like a three pronged approach all at the same time. And one is helping a kid take action when they're feeling sad or anxious or worried, some kind of tangible thing they can do. Mm. It sounds like they are using FaceTime and, and calling and talking to friends, but that almost, you know, makes it makes it harder sometimes, which I understand. So uh, just something I thought of is like sitting down and drawing a picture, writing a letter, putting it in an envelope, putting the stamp on it, putting it in the mail. It's it's a simple thing, but it's, it's also a physical, tangible thing that a kid can do when they are feeling sad. And it's a good way to kind of connect the feelings they're having to an action they can take. And so that was just one idea. Um, But then while you're helping them take action, also help them get connected in the new place and just know that that takes time. So you don't see the results right away. It might mean, you know, trying out a new play group or a new, you know, music class or whatever. It might mean going to explore a different park every weekend and kind of making it fun to explore the new place. But I don't think you'll see, you won't see his face light up right away. Like you're probably hoping to, but it is, it is still kind of an important piece of this because the more of those connections you forge in the new community, the more it will start to feel like home. And that's true for adults too, I think. Right. Um, and then the last thing is just, just let sad feelings be okay. And I know that's like, I feel like we come back to that again and again on this show, Megan, is it's not easy, but eventually we have to let it be okay for our kids to be sad and mm-hmm. not worry that it's, he's, he's not going to be sad forever. Right. It's not, it's you're, not you haven't traumatized him. him for right. life. You didn't, yeah. I always say this, you didn't do this to him. Like you're not, you don't have to somehow make up for this awful thing you did. That's not, that's not how it works. He, the, he's going through a transition and he will have real feelings about it. And you don't have to absorb them yourself or feel guilty for them. And just, and letting him know too, that those sad feelings are a natural part of this um, without having to kind of be like, 
oh, but you know, yeah. your school oh, is so, so fun. It, it's so great. And like, look at all, look at the opportunities mom and dad have here. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. So right. I think yeah. if you kind of keep those three things, helping him take action with, you know, with missing people, helping him get connected in the new place and then just letting the sad feelings be okay. Then yeah. it's just about like, it just will get better if you're doing all those things over and over again, but it's not easy. I, I love that. I would add two things. One okay. would be, um, I know. Cause I moved a lot when I was a kid and I still remember moving halfway through my kindergarten year. Like I, I remember that, like, I just, I just don't, I don't remember a lot about it, but I definitely remember what that felt like to be suddenly in a new classroom. Yep. And you know, it, it's something that sticks with you. I think that, um, one thing that always really helped me when my parents thought to do it, and I wouldn't say they always did, but I have been kind of conscientious about trying to do it, is to talk about the old place. Like, rip, yes, like I love that. Because they have short memory spans and they will start to forget. Yes. Um, and for you to bring it back up and just say, oh, hey, I thought I looked up our old house on Google Earth or whatever. And remember what this looked like? And I love that. Whenever I'm able to, like, tap into some yeah. place from my past, I always feel really good about that and yeah. really connected to it. And it really doesn't make me sad. It actually makes me really happy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I know this is many years later, but having those connections. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, right now with him, you know, doing the FaceTiming or I think writing letters is great. I would just be prepared that there may be a time when he doesn't want to mm -hmm. like, and I think that's very natural too. Like if he doesn't want to talk to his old friends for a while or, you know, grandparents and cousins and stuff like that, it might just be like for him to really settle in in the new place yeah. and embrace it he kind of needs to like let go of the old yeah. place a little bit and that can feel weird because yeah. you're like well wait a second this is your family you can't yeah. you know but it's like kids the way that their sense of time passing works is different uh -huh. than ours like they're just they're it's kind of like you know it's kind of like if you broke up with someone and you had to put all their pictures away yeah. right like yeah <laughs> like sometimes you just need that sort of separation to to embrace what's next yeah. and I think that that could happen like sooner than you think it could take like one good friend yeah suddenly he's all in on this one friend and doesn't really want to have a lot to do with the people yeah. that he used to talk to so that won't last forever either especially if we're talking about you know cousins and grandparents yes. it's like he's always going to love them um but he might that intensity might ease up and i think that's okay and probably very healthy actually well, and actually what came up for me as you were talking is um his memories will start to be right now. The memories of our, are when we lived there, when we lived right. there and the cousins were right down the road or whatever, his memories will soon start to also include visits and making yep. visits really fun. And so that's something that's happened with our Arizona friends. We didn't leave family behind there, but we did leave close friends behind. And first of all, my younger two kids do not even remember when we lived there, they were 18 months and newly four. Um, but what they remember now is the visits we have every year, sometimes a couple times a year with, with our Arizona friends. And they have actually built relationships with those kids. They're like cousins to my kids. They're not cousins. And their memories are completely based on our back and forth visits. They're not, they're no yeah. longer um, rooted in the memory of living there. So we've, we've kind of layered this other type of relationship. And I think yeah. that will start to make things easier because the, the dynamic of having out of town family and cousins is different than the dynamic of having in town, but, but it can be also really special when you, when you look forward to those visits and then remember those visits and look at the pictures. So that it's so new that that hasn't become part of the right. pattern yet, but it will. And I think that will probably help. And those memories will start to become more front of mind, like more right. relevant to his day-to-day -day life than the, than the old memories. And exactly. that's good too. Cause that's reality. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share something really quick that I think is so funny is that also you know, kids have this way of romanticizing things sometimes um, and remembering things differently than mm -hmm. perhaps they actually happened. So we lived in a house when we were had just lived in St. Joe for a little while. So Clara was a baby, like the boys were little and we lived in this little house that wasn't nothing fancy, nothing super nice. It had a, like a nice little yard and a tree house. Oh, okay. And I was really excited about the tree house. It was like, it was like a tree house that was attached to like a little swing set and a slide. And I think the first day the kids played on it, there was a spider on it and they refused to <laughs> the entire time we lived there. They would not go back on that tree house. Uh -huh. like they wouldn't play. They wouldn't go anywhere near it. And it drove me nuts. I'm like, this, this is beautiful backyard. Go play in the tree house. They wouldn't. So we move. And about a year later, the kids start waxing nostalgic <laughs> about the great house why did we ever leave that house? It was so great. Remember the tree house? And they went on and on about the tree house. And I'm just like, Ser am I on candid camera? Are like, we what in is the happening same reality? Right now? Yeah, we're in the same room. Did I like somehow like 
you know, transport out of a like a parallel universe. And they weren't super tiny. Some of them were older. Yes. Yes. (laughs) They were. And every single time we've moved, they've been super excited about the new house. But then later, it's like they come up with this sort of idea about the old house that they didn't even have when we lived in it. And I think that's very normal, too. It's like, I think it's normal for kids to. You know, however it plays out. Yes. It's whatever it is, it's probably and normal. And it's so <laughs> different depending on your age. A five-year-old's yep. experience of that would be so different than an eight or a two. Okay, yep. now I have to share a super quick funny story, which is related to a playhouse or not treehouse, but in this case, like swing set playhouse. Just the timing of our move from Arizona. We made the big splurge and bought, they sell it at Costco. It's like the really nice wooden oh, yeah. um, swing set and playhouse. And it goes on sale every once in a while. We made the big splurge and then we hired a handyman to help come put it together because you're supposed to do it by yourself, but it's like a really big job. We had a really nice big backyard in Arizona. I want to say it was put together and the kids got to play with it, play out there for the first time on like May 15th. And on May 31st, we found out we were moving out of state. (laughs) So we built this huge and it stayed there. It was too big to move. Our new house doesn't have a big backyard. And and then it was going into Arizona summer. So the only two months where we continued to live there, it was hot. So we the kids still talk about that. Like, remember the big play, like the big swing set that we had for like a a second? (laughs) I certainly hope. I certainly hope that the people who moved into the house after you were a family of kids who enjoyed it and not like. A retired couple who are like, let's okay, so, knock it down and put so it in a pool. So that's really funny. The lady <laughs> did like it. She was single with grown kids, but she had like a foster grandkid or someone. Oh, and she actually would send grandkid. us, she would send us emails <laughs> and stuff saying we had so much fun on the swing set. Aww. So she did appreciate it. And she appreciated having a house where this kid could come play and whatever. But anyway, my kids still talk about that. How we bought I them love it. a swing set for like a second. Okay. So our next question comes from Teresa and I can set this up. Um, But she says, I am a nervous flyer. I don't let it stop me from getting on an airplane to travel, but I'm sure it shows all over my face that I'm scared. And sometimes I have to grip the armrests, which Mm. I totally, totally been there. Um, She said, someday I will take my kids on their first flight. I don't want them to pick up on my anxiety. And I really don't want them to to develop the same fear that I have. Um, So do you have any tips about this? And I picked this question because you and I both have fear of flying in our history in different ways. So why don't you go first? Yeah, well, I would just say like I was actually a very nervous flyer and then flying with my kids almost cured it. Yeah, almost cured me of it, at least when I'm flying with them. Um, Something about having to keep them distracted and busy meant I really couldn't like I didn't even have time to think about being scared. And like also, I think so much of what they'll probably be doing on the plane is not looking at you. They're going to be looking at the window. They're going to be looking at their tablet. They're going to be looking around. I, I think that unless you're like breathing into a bag. Yeah that are crying <laughs> are crying. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that it's going to be as evident to them as you're worried about. And it might not, it might be like a cure. It might really be something that helps you. Okay. So that was very similar to my experience. I flew a lot as a kid and I can remember the first time I felt afraid on an airplane and I was like 19 years old. So for some mm-hmm. reason I was never afraid and I flew quite a bit as a teenager and I went away to college and then for some reason And it wasn't even like caused by a traumatic flight or anything. But around the time I was like 18, 19, like a sophomore in college until I had kids. So for like 10 years, I was pretty legit afraid of flying. I mean, like like Teresa, I didn't I didn't let it from stop me from traveling, but it was like I had to psych myself up and it was very unpleasant. I was never relaxed. And then the same thing, it kind of went away when I had kids and the busier I got with my kids, the more it was like chasing a toddler down the aisle and all the logistics of planning travel it just filled up my brain and I just didn't really have time for it. Now I will say that since then I've had a couple of um, crazier flights, like bad turbulence and stuff. And because it's not as crazy flying with my kids anymore, like I can sit back and look out the window. I've had it. I feel like flare up a little bit more. So just sort of normalizing it that it's really normal, but I totally agree. I'm glad you said that about normally I would say, Oh yeah, our kids pick up on our moods and they pick up on stuff. I kind of agree that you would have to be really obviously panicked for them to right. notice but what it does come out as sometimes is um stress or being like grumpy with your kids yes yeah. so whatever you can do to make the details of flying with your kids you know having your spouse there su- for support if you can just doing all the prep and planning so you've got your snacks and you've got good media for everybody to consume because probably the way it will come out is more like 
being grumpy with everybody and they will notice that and they will, you know, notice that mom's kind of grumpy on airplanes or whatever, but I'm kind of hopeful. And that's why I wanted to address this question is I'm kind of hopeful that, um, Teresa might actually experience a little less fear of flying and, Um, and make sure you give yourself, um, that you set yourself up for success too. like, make sure that you, if something like being separated from your kids on the flight, which could happen, um, would stress you out make sure you paid extra for that seat or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is that you have to do yeah, at a time. That's a good point to just kind of, cause the last thing you want, unless you feel like so, some people are different. Like for me running through the airport, because I'm like not quite late, but like not quite super on time either. And all that kind of stuff is almost like a positive stressor in that it, it distracts me from, uh-huh. from the relaxed fear that yeah. you can get on a plane when nothing's going wrong, but like you just have time to think about it. Yeah. So you know, it's like it's that that sweet spot between not getting there super early. So you have time to sit there and get all stressed. Right. And think about it, but also not have something weird go wrong that yeah. like, oh, now it suddenly turns out my carry on is a little too big. Yeah. And I have to I have to check it and what I've got stuff in it and like all those little stresses that yeah. could come up at the last minute. Just like doubly prepared that yeah. those won't happen. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I think it's I think it's going to be OK, Teresa. You'll have yeah, to let I us do. know. I do, too. I really do. And I have had like you. um like you described, Sarah, when I was in my 20s, I developed full on panic on planes for no reason. Yeah. It wasn't nothing happened. Yeah. It was just I just got scared. Well, and that's <laughs> another it's another good point that um, I mean, not to get super morbid, but when we're all afraid of flying, like we are afraid of like the very worst thing happening. Right. And I think most of our kids, even if they felt like some bumps or, mm-hmm. or if the flight was otherwise stressful, I don't, I don't think that most of their, I think that's why I wasn't afraid till I was like 18 or 19 is well, they're not thinking about mortality. They yet. aren't it's just, exactly yeah. that. Thank you for just putting it bluntly. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> even if they sense some stress in you or yeah. um, any of that, I just don't think their their minds are not going where ours do and ours right. do. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a break. We'll take <laughs> okay. a couple more. All right, guys, we're talking about sponsor FabFitFun. I'm back to beat the drum again (laughs) because every time I get one of these boxes, I feel like I'm still discovering how much I love what's in them for weeks to come or like longer than that because right now I'm looking around my bedroom and I can see so many little touches, beauty products, decor, jewelry, accessories, storage things. These are all things I got for my quarterly FabFitFun box and have used and loved ever since. And I just love how these little touches have become part of my life but they aren't things I necessarily would have discovered on my own. So in case you guys haven't somehow heard yet, because we have been raving about them for like over a year, FabFitFun is a seasonal subscription box that features full-size beauty, fitness, fashion, and lifestyle products. There's always at least $200 worth of products in the box, but I would argue it's often more like $300 worth. And the box retails for under 50 bucks. My spring box just came a couple of weeks ago and it's amazing. And you can also customize what comes in your box. So after you sign up, You'll take a quiz with all your style and beauty preferences and they'll try to select products that are a good fit for you. But then you can also customize on top of that. So yeah. it really is geared really toward you. Um, we want you to check it out, guys, because I don't think you'll be disappointed. It's going to be $10 off your first box mm-hmm. if you use our coupon code. So go to fabfitfun.com. Use the coupon code the mom hour to get $10 off. Again, that's fabfitfun.com. Use the coupon code the mom hour. You're going to get $10 off your first box, making it a steal at thirty nine ninety nine. Do it, guys. So good. I loved the spring box, by the way. It's one of my favorites. Well, I am welcoming back our sponsor, Hopster, today. You guys know I'm super picky about the media my kids consume, both the quantity and the quality. So whenever we get approached by an app geared toward really little kids, I'm kind of skeptical, to be honest. Happy to report, though, that our new sponsor, Hopster, was not only a hit with my kindergartner, but even my older kids wanted to give it a try. So what it is, it's a subscription app for kids ages two to six, where kids can access high quality shows, learning games, fun music, and more. It's a safe, ad-free place where kids can watch cute little videos and nursery rhymes and it's just really well designed. Um, one criteria for me for a kid's app is that it's something they can navigate around themselves without needing my help because most likely if I've given them a tablet, it's because I want to be unavailable for a little bit. Right. Um, and Hopster totally checked the box for me there. So I love that the content is handpicked by their content team and not delivered via algorithm like YouTube kids. So kids aren't going to accidentally stumble across something that looks innocent, but isn't. We keep hearing that in the news lately. Yeah, yes. So they, the Hopster team chooses programming that's fun and wholesome and they weed out the junk so you don't have to. And it's 100% ad free. Hopster is really adamant about that. So we have arranged for you guys to try out Hopster for an entire month for free. Normally their free trial is just seven days. So this is a really good deal. Head to hopster.tv 
Select use voucher and then your voucher code is the mom hour and you'll get that extended one month free trial. Again, it's hopster, H-O-P-S-T-E-R dot TV. And you have to click use voucher and then enter the mom hour to get that extended one month free trial. All right. Should we get back to it? Yeah, let's do it. Um, Do you want to set up Kimberly's question? Sure. Okay, so Kimberly um, is a stay at home mom. Her kids are in full day school and she says it leaves her with an abyss of time. I can (laughs) I can relate where she could do anything. So she does nothing. And she actually uh, mentions our favorite uh, our favorites from 2018 episode, which was that like just kind of at the end of the year, right? Yeah. And I think what she's referring to, I think I was trying to remember the question, but I think it was something you realized about yourself in 2018 and you kind of shared this. I'll let you continue. Yeah. Well, just that when I have, when I could do anything, it's very easy to do nothing. Yeah. So having a lot of free time does not always lead to the uh, outcome. (laughs) Yeah. You think it will, or suddenly taking your schedule from super busy to super open doesn't always mean you're going to like explode with productivity. Yeah. Um, so she said that then she finds herself acting moody and struggles to be productive when she's in a negative mindset. And I think I talked about that in the episode yeah. too, just how, how it would make me very, like, I was just, I realized how moody I can really be yes. and how much my moods kind of can dictate how much I get done in a yeah. day and how productive I actually can be, especially when I'm the one creating my own schedule and I'm not relying on small people right. to tell me, you know, to kind of shape my day by right. having needs when that went away my moods can tend to shape my day and that can be good or bad. So she says, um, can you please speak to recognizing this and what tricks or tools you use to move through it? If you know, you'll feel better in a few hours. How do you spend the time that's in between? How do you organize your day to feed your extra, your extroversion, but get things accomplished? So uh, I think that the first thing that I do is if I can, if, if the, if it's possible, is kind of lean into the moodiness. And that yeah. took me a while to get to, but I just realized the more I fight it or the more I feel bad about it, then it's almost like it just sets me up to feel dissatisfied. Like then you're layering on top yeah. of the moodiness. You also feel like the sense of like failure or panic yeah. because you're not getting stuff done fast. So like it just compounds and adds on. And if you could just kind of be like, you know, this morning I'm not getting out of my pajamas mm-hmm. for a couple hours or, and it's, I don't want to do that every day. Right? right. But like, if I don't fight it so hard and I just, when I really need it, if I just really take care of myself in that little way, then I find that it's easier to be like, Oh, I'm on the other side of that now. Yeah. Um, little things that I can do to feel productive typically gets me moving in the right direction. So it could be something really, really dumb and simple, mm-hmm. like wipe down the sink or, yeah. you know, leave one room for another. Like if there's a room that you're used to sitting in in the morning and that's where you always sit and try to get yourself going, try a different room, Mm -hmm. like go someplace else, um, go someplace where there's more light. That's Mm -hmm. another thing that it sounds so like dumb, but during the winter here, the weather is gray and, and crappy and that can really affect your mood. Um, I like to peg productive, like little productive bursts of activity to routines that I find pleasurable. So while my kettle is boiling for tea, I could go, I guess, sit down and get on my phone, but I could also go ahead and load the dishwasher because mm-hmm. I'm in there anyway. Um, maybe I don't want to go to the gym, but I can tell myself that if I go to the gym, I'm going to go get myself a little treat afterward or something yeah. like that. And, you know, not to, it's not about like treating yourself for every single thing you do, but it's just for, it's like creating pleasantness around things that yeah. don't always feel pleasant. And then I said, like, when in doubt, leave the house. Yeah. Because often just getting stuck. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to leave the house because you're going to meet anybody. Right. You can meet, you can go do anything you want. You can go sit in your car if you want to. Right. But sometimes just getting out of that, those four walls around you starting to kind of like close in. Yeah. Can be helpful. I don't know, yeah. Sarah, what do you think? Okay. Well, I have some thoughts in there, like, um, just different because I think you, you have dealt with this so specifically and can speak to it. So personally, yeah. I just barely have kids in full-time school. So right. I think I'm like, and you've been busy ever and, since. And I have been busy ever since. Yeah. So the first thing I want to say, um, Kimberly said that she thought she was unmotivated and lazy until she heard you talk about this kind of your, the way you have dealt with different swings of energy and right. mood. Um, but one thing we know about motivation is I think all of us have had times in our life where we're super, super internally motivated because we have a purpose, right? Like we have right. something, it's a job, it's a career, it's a baby, it's a project, it's a move. Something, um, right. So one thing I just want to acknowledge is having kids in school full time, if you've been a stay at home mom and you are still a stay at home mom, but with a very different time structure, that is like an identity shift. It's a pretty, yes. it, it's a pretty big identity shift right up there with becoming a mom or going back to work. If you have been home, any of those. So, um, 
part of that is like just acknowledging that you're not unmotivated and lazy, but maybe you haven't figured out like what is what lights me up in this phase of my life. So I am a stay at home mom. My kids are in school. What do I want to spend those hours doing? Or what is my kind of, I don't know, greater purpose sounds like cheesier than I want. But you understand like you need a challenge, right? We all do. We all need something that gets us out of bed in the morning. And and in my all of a sudden, all your challenges went away to school. Yeah. (laughs) Now what? You know, right. And I think it can be it literally can be anything. We've seen moms like go full bore into a creative pursuit. Like they start a blog or they get into photography. We've also seen moms get super involved volunteering at school. We've also seen moms who don't do that and find some, find something else. But I do feel like it's a time where just like when you have your first baby, everything you knew about yourself is kind of ripped out from under you. And the same is true. And so I just want to validate that for, yeah, for, for Kimberly sure. and say and it's the transition almost, takes some time. Yeah, it takes it's, time. Exactly. And it's hard to judge yourself for being unmotivated or lazy when you haven't even um, decided what the what the motivation is for, it, you know, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. Another thing that I've I've realized and this took me until pretty recently, I think I talked about it maybe in a recent episode. I don't even know now. Now I don't know when did I talk about it on an episode with you? Um, <laughs> on Voxer or something, but I've also realized that like my like productivity or getting things done. Like, we always talk on the show about how things aren't linear. Things don't happen like just because you're home and your kids are at school from eight thirty to three thirty or whatever it is, doesn't mean from eight thirty to three thirty you need to be on your feet like getting stuff yeah. done mm-hmm. that entire time Monday through Friday. Maybe it doesn't look like that. Um, I realize that I have like a pretty predictable pattern, and the more that I kind of lean into it, the better I am. And that's like I have times when I'm almost like consuming, like I'm reading a lot. I'm looking at what other people are doing. I'm like taking it all in. And that might be, I'm reading blogs. That might be, I'm looking at Instagram. That might be like, I'm looking at other people's routines or I'm like researching meal plans or whatever it is. Like I'm, I'm doing more consumption than I am actually doing things. And then I need like some time to, I'm calling it synthesize it. Like I'm, my brain is going, Oh, what parts of this do I like? What parts of this don't I like? Da da da. And then there's the doing. And sometimes the doing is really a small, like it looks like a small piece mm-hmm. of, but the whole, the whole pattern matters. Yeah. And it might not all happen in one day. You might not go like consume, synthesize, produce, consume, yep. synthesize. Yep. You know, it might be like two days of sitting around looking at stuff, a day of thinking about it and two days of working yeah. on it. Yeah. It all counts. I really like that. Um, just on a very practical note, I've talked about it before, but for newer listeners, um, I definitely, it helps me to see my week at a glance and there's lots mm-hmm. of ways to do that, but I am a digital calendar person, but I like to print out my Google calendar every week. So it's just one page printout and I fold it in half and stick it in my notebook. But there's something about seeing the week at a glance that helps me know where my energy patterns are going to go and know like, okay, this day is going to be hardcore, like running errands and getting life stuff done. And sometimes that means I'm actually able to strategically like put more of the same type of activity on that day. Like Megan, we've kind of settled into this recording on Thursdays thing. And so sometimes I'll look at that and say, Oh, I'm going to actually do a conference call and this other thing on Thursday, because that way I'm just talking and sitting all day long and it's all done. And then I have this other day, for X, Y, Z. So I, um, depending on how you like to be in your calendar, a week at a time is a really good way for me to manage my kind of energy ups and downs because you can't have the perfect balance in a day, but you might be able to, over the course of a week, think about what you want to get done and kind of then take what you know about your own energy patterns and kind of make it work for you. So I also like that because if you've got it a a week at a glance, if something goes wrong and you have to move something Uh for some reason, you're looking at the whole week at once and yes. you can go, oh, okay. So that's not going to work. Th-. But instead of panicking or like hitting, hitting a wall right. where you're like, well, throw the whole week out. Yeah. It's over. You can see where there's other open spots yeah. or where something would make sense to swap and looking, being able to look at like almost in blocks of yes. things that you're doing feels almost like you're playing like Tetris or something. Yes. And that's just move things around. It's so funny. If you see my calendar, it it's a hybrid of digital because it starts, I do like to have things digitally, but once I print out the week, it moves to chicken scratch, right? Because we can Mm. only like by Sunday, I think I know what the week ahead is going to be like. I have appointments in there. I have the kids activities and it's, it's been printed out from Google, but after that it turns to pen and paper and I am like moving stuff around. I'm writing stuff down. I might write our meal plan at the end of each day. And so it really is like, like you said, it's like a moving tart, like Tetris. It's like, you're just moving pieces around. So it works. It works for me. 
Okay. So we are going to take a question from Emily and she uh, recorded it. And so we will play that now. Hi, Megan and Sarah. I love your podcast and your episodes tend to come in right when I need them. Uh, This is Emily from New York and I have a 17 month old um, toddler and I am trying to find that balance between um, nursing around the clock and being a you know, a new stay at home mom and running my own business and doing self care. And my husband, um, he sometimes pops in listening to the mom podcast with me. And he's like, how do I, you know, support you? And I know this is a very individual question, but I don't think there's a lot of support out there for dads. Um, And I, you know, I don't have like a concrete answer to what he's looking for. So I'm wondering if you have any um, males that could talk to their experience about how to support their partners during the toddler years, um, especially when all he wants is mommy, mommy all the time and won't go to anyone else. So uh, any feedback or anything would be appreciated. Thank you. Love your show. Well, thank you, Emily. First of all, um, I love the idea of getting a dad's perspective. We did not do that to answer your question right here, right now, but I'm definitely going to tuck that away and think about how we can do that. Um, And I also love that her husband is so supportive and wants to support her. uh, Proactively too. That's nice. Yeah. So I think there's so much good going on here. Um, So a couple of things I wanted to speak to, I I also have, you know, a partner who's really supportive and often wants to help me before I even know what kind of help (laughs) I want. Right. And that it takes a while to kind of know, um, what kind of breaks you need when you are the soul, especially the breastfeeding, like you're the physical body that a baby needs. I honestly think our brains go a little bit to mush and we like literally can't figure out. We could have all, you could have like your mother-in-law, your husband, your mom all lined up ready to help. And you're just like, I I don't even know because I I have to do everything. Just when you, right. When you get used to bouncing from doing one thing to the next, to the next, and you're keeping this child alive. Yeah. Um, and then there's someone's like, how could I help you? You're like, I, you can't like, what would yeah. I even, how would I remove or isolate one part of this? It becomes really difficult to not see it as one big hole. Right. And to think this is this part that I could take out and hand off to someone else. Right. It's hard. It is hard. And then the other thing that we, if she's 17 months in now, like they've got their routines down, um, they, they know how things are working. I think as moms, sometimes we get, and I'm not speaking for Emily, but I know for myself, we get a little control freaky sometimes yeah. about, I finally got the systems down. I know what she likes at bedtime. I know like how to cut the grapes the right way for daycare. Like I know how to do it all. So therefore we almost set ourselves up to fail with allowing support to come in in different ways because we've worked so hard to like figure out how to do it all. It feels like somehow mm-hmm. going backwards to let somebody in. So I just want to offer a vote for letting, letting your spouse help. Number one, looking for those ways that feel like you could offload. And then finally, I want to speak to the clingy toddler. Cause I have had those. And in fact, I have a six-year-old who would prefer to be with me all the time and not her father, which is nothing against her father. Cause he's available and wonderful. And she just would still prefer me. I think, um, whatever you can do now to build in some expectation for the toddler that sometimes it's daddy time. Um, I think I could have done this better, to be honest. Um, I know my sister-in-law has a thing where they alternate the bedtime routine no matter what. So it's like, if it's daddy's night, it's daddy's night. If it's mommy's night, it's mommy's night. And the kids don't have a say in it. Now that might not work for your family and your schedule, but I kind of like that it doesn't, um, accommodate those whimsical, not whimsical, those flighty preferences of a toddler for one parent over the other. Um, and, and it's, it's a slippery slope because they prefer mom. So mom does all the things and then dad doesn't know how to do the things. So then when he does step in and mom is out for that one time, she got to go out with her friends, daddy messes up bedtime because he's never had to do it. So it's like, it's kind of a cycle. And if you've got an available supportive spouse, I would just really encourage you to think of ways little routines that they can do together or, or times when you are just flat out unavailable. Cause you go for a walk every Tuesday night with your friends yep. and you are not there. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I think, I think that what the last thing you said was kind of what I was going to say is I, I think I have a big vote for leaving the house because yes. when you're in the house, it just changes the dynamic. First of all, your toddler knows you're there yeah. and there's no place you can hide that your yep. toddler won't know that you're there in the house. <laughs> your husband knows you're there and 
will probably have some stage fright, like trying to figure things right. out when he knows that you are so capable and have been doing this the whole time and you already know what's going on. Toddlers freaking out or crying or whatever. Like he's not going to feel super confident about being able to figure out on his own, which he needs to be able to do to really embrace it and not have it be like a big deal every single time. Right. And then you'll be stressed because you're hearing it all go awry in the next room. And it's not a big deal. Like it's not a big deal that it's going awry, but it's, but it will feel like one. It will feel like more of one to both of you. I think if you're there Mm -hmm. witnessing it happening Mm -hmm. while your husband's trying to figure it out. So like, yeah, like go for the walk. Uh, Maybe if I don't know what you're, you know, arrangement is right now, but if there's a possibility for you to get away for a night, yeah, I think that this age can be good for that. I did it differently with my different kids. Um, and I actually think it was really good. Like with Owen and Clara, I left a little younger uh-huh. for um, conferences when they were younger than with the older. I can't remember exactly how old they were, but I want to say 14, 15 months yeah. with Clara, which was the youngest I'd ever left a kid. And then I really saw the benefit of it. Like yeah. I really saw how that helped them. Yeah. Um, the two of them kind of create some confidence around yeah. each other. And the other thing is, I think that could be really helpful with a toddler who really just wants mom is for dad and baby to go somewhere mm-hmm, together mm-hmm. because that's always going to seem exciting Yeah, to tod- like the toddler, like you leaving is not going to be as exciting as right. them leaving. Yes. No, and I think you could do both, but I think sometimes one is a nice like transition to the other. Yeah. And, and I think going back to when I was talking about like routines and rituals, I think if we're, if the, if you're stuck in this pattern where he wants to help, you're not sure how the baby only wants you. I think creating a new, a new ritual or a new routine where like they do the grocery shopping together every right. Saturday morning. Number yep. one, he helps with the grocery shopping. You get to let go of that a little bit. Number two, they get bonding time. But if it's something that um, number three, you get alone time and you get alone time. So like that's a win, win, in your win. own house, which can be hard to get when you've yes. got a toddler. Like so you might go out, but it's really hard sometimes to just get quiet time in your house. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, it is kind of hard to know what you need and she might not, Emily might not know exactly what she needs or how her husband could support her, but you can at least try. And then you can think, you know what? I don't like being by myself on Saturday mornings. Let's, I'd rather do something as a family. So that didn't work. What's another way we can facilitate this, but it does sound like they're ready for just the next phase of family dynamics. Um, and I think it's great that he's, you know, wanting, wanting to be supportive. And I do think we should get a dad, a dad on to weigh in at some point. Yep. Agreed. All right. Okay, guys. So before we wrap, I just want to mention a couple of things. We talked about this last week, but if you would like to send in a question for us to address, um, there's a couple ways to do it. If you go to our website at themomhour.com and look in the sidebar, there's a little thing called speak pipe. It's cool because it will record your voice, um, but you can also listen back and um, like delete it if you don't like it first. So it won't just send it to us. Um, You can also use the voice memo recorder on your phone and record yourself that way and email us at hello at the mom hour.com. Um, we please do, we yeah, please do. And we do get a lot of questions. We don't answer them all. Sometimes it's something we can't speak to personally. And this has happened like quite a bit where it's a really good question, but if we don't have personal experience, I mean, that's kind of the whole shtick of our show, right? right. <laughs> so yeah. it does, sometimes it becomes something that we tuck away and think that would be a good thing to bring an expert on and talk about. Yeah. Um, Sometimes that's because we get a lot of questions that are very similar. So if you don't hear yours, it might be because we answered another really similar one. Um, And so, you know, that's just, that's just the reality, but we do try and kind of cover a wide variety and we love hearing your voices and hearing what's going on with you guys. So keep those questions coming in. Um, And then also on our website, I will link up, uh, we have a page with past listener questions episodes. I want to say this is like the 16th or 17th time we've done this. It's some really high number now. Um, And we have a page where they're listed out by topic. So if you're, if you're wanting to listen to more listener questions episodes, we have a place where you can quickly look and see, oh, they discuss, you know, toddler sleep issues in that one or whatever. And so you can check to see what we've covered in the past so Megan this was fun this was really fun and the next time we talk to you guys it will be episode do you want to say the number Megan 200 (laughs) that was easy it's only when it's going to be like 257 that that's going to become really hard for me I think we'll be old by then you're right yeah sounds like a year well it sounds like six months from now all right guys well we'll catch you next week for episode 200 bye